All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Desiree Pointer Mace. I am a professor of education at Alverno College. Uh, this is a Google Hangout for my CIT 631 uh, Using Technology Tools in Instructional Settings course. Uh, I'm joined here this evening by some of my graduate students in the course, as well as a guest speaker, uh, Matt Hakes. Matt is an alum of the program at Alverno and uh, has done some relevant work in this area, and so I thought that it would be very interesting to have uh, Matt's perspective on this, um, on how, where he is with his work since he uh, did his um, graduate study. So Matt, do you want to introduce yourself just a little bit? And then I'm going to actually take us into the presentation bit, but um, go ahead and just introduce yourself. My name is Matt Hakes. I'm born and raised right out here in Wisconsin. Uh, I am currently CTO, partner, founding partner of Virtual Freight Inspections. Uh, the, board, the board has decided to make me president in July 1st, so I'll be taking over as president of our company. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we are a... We have 200 plus subcontractors and independent contractors around the country who um, use virtual tools that we build and design to create our product. Our customers come online to use our product. Uh, our inspectors come online to create the product. And in the end, um, our customers receive the product online. And we also invoice online. So we, for 10 years now, we've been a paperless company. The only paper we have to generate are the 1099s at the end of the year that the government requires. So we're wow. kind of <laughs> We're proud of that. We, we are a paperless company. Um, as you said, I, my background uh, also includes organizational development classes and a degree from Alberno. And it was my focus to look at work team tools because we, wherever I am, as so long as I have a smartphone, I can work. Or if I have a tablet, I can work. Yes. I don't really need an office. We're, we, we grew up that way. We planned it that way. Uh, we didn't know it was trendy when we started 10 years ago. As a matter of fact, our major competition in this, the area that we're in said, I, I don't think that Internet thing is going to take off. So he had right. a different, different viewpoint. But we, we really focused on that. And so I wound up, wound up looking at the tools that would help. Everyone's independent, and everyone has different technology, and everyone uses a Mac or a, their tablet or their phone. And what will work to bring people together to get something done? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And we'll have a chance to take a look a little bit more into that process. Um, but just to welcome everybody, this is, I'm just going to, hopefully you can see my slides here. Uh, but I'm just going to, as usual, this is the structure for our um, meetings on Monday evenings. And this evening, we will have, we'll just start briefly with a summary of what we did in our last meeting so that Matt can get a sense of uh, what all we are um, focusing on. Then we'll have Matt uh, speak, and, and we'll take questions for him. If you aren't able to uh, speak and be heard, certainly Kathy, others who are able to um, speak and be heard can certainly ask their questions um, that way. Other folks, uh, Lynn, Shelley, can ask their questions via the um, group chat at the right. That way Matt and I will both be able to see those questions as they come in. Um, so last time we met, it wasn't last week, but we had a spring break and then a, an independent work week. We had Kathy presenting, and Matt, you'll see Kathy there in the in the um, with the poster there behind her. Uh, she is at she works in teaching. Um, well, Kathy, do you want to talk a little bit about what you do? Um, I'm an instructor. I'm the program coordinator um, and instructor for the Health Information Technology Program at MATC. Um, and um, right now we're dealing with the electronic health record, so like you, um, I deal with no paper. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of exciting. It's, um, we're starting a associate degree program this uh, year. It was our right. first year. So. Yeah, and so one of the things that Kathy described is, you know, because we're framing our work here around um, everybody is in very different settings. Uh, everybody is uh, has different kinds of ways of being an instructor. And so as a result, the, the centerpiece of this class is really focusing around uh, individualizing um, what is the dilemma in your setting that technology tools might assist with? How can you experiment and innovate with some of those uh, ideas? How can you document your process of making those changes? and represent your practice so that others can learn from your process. 
Uh, so flipped classroom is the idea, the main idea that Kathy is trying out, but of course there are any number of um, technologies that are integrated into the idea of flipped classroom. So she's trying a lot of different kinds of things and will be tracking her learning throughout. Um, and then, uh, so the other, um, Anna, who is uh, an instructional design student who is um, seeking a different uh, workplace setting, so she is um, volunteering at uh, an ESL kind of setting at, um, I think it's, is it MIAT or MATC? But uh, she is looking at kind of instructional design challenges and is also making connections between this class and instructional design um, theory that she's lear learning about in her ID courses. Okay. Um, this class also is a little bit of a mashup in that um, I also teach an undergraduate course for, um, for people who are going to be teachers and they are um, having a little bit more structured process of um, developing expertise in technology. So okay. in ED216, last week they were working independently um, on group projects which were investigating different kinds of learning styles um, and uh, you know basically that they could self-select into those. So if they like to read, they could have some online reading and then use some online writing tools. Um, if they like gaming, they could build a game. If they like apps, they could build an app and so on. Um, and so that's a little bit more structured for people who, who might be in a position of wanting to learn a little bit more. We have a real diversity of expertise among the students in this graduate course. And so basically that's a way to provide a little bit greater support to people who might be at the more introductory level or feel less confident regarding their technology expertise. So that brings us to your slide. So here we are, and uh, I copied and pasted um, some of the bullet points about you from your LinkedIn. And uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, CTO and future president uh, doing virtual freight inspections. So that's wonderful. And by the way, you should let me know uh, formally what your title is and when you're moving into that and whenever you can announce it, because I'd love to announce that to our um, grad newsletter. Uh, but also, you have a really important um, calling in your work supporting children and youth. And I know actually personally from, from your work with some people that I've also served as a, as a teacher that you, that is a big um, important part of your work as well. Right. So uh, without further ado, um, I would love to uh, pass it over to you. And, um, and if you care to sh screen share or whatever, that's completely fine. But I think the main thing that I'd love to hear you talk about is um, how did you come to develop, um, well, how did you identify this dilemma that you had around effective tools for collaborative virtual teams? Um, how did you get started in trying out different things? And then how did it lead into your action research project and beyond? Great questions. The main difficulty I had is that I'm a, I'm, I actually write software for a living. And unlike people who... Uh, write software for people in a company where they can control the technology. I just write software and I have 200 people who buy in. Now, I don't know what their software is. I don't know what their hardware is. Where is Mac, Windows Internet Explorer 6, or Chrome? They're all over the place. So I was stuck with, okay, they, what tools do they have? What can I assume fairly uh, to use as a baseline? I didn't know the answer to this question. Is it reasonable? to say that these people have email. Is it reasonable that they have a video camera on their laptop? Uh, one of the things I learned very quickly is the demographic in the sense of the person I'm working with. If a person's under 30, this is the tool of choice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. When I started. Uh, and so how do I write software that will work here as well as software or think about you know, how do I integrate all these people who I'm actually literally teaching them how to install a browser on their, mm -hmm. on their, on their machine? So what were some reasonable expectations? What would work? And then the other thing that's probably more germane to what, what we're all about is everyone learns differently. Mm -hmm. needs different facilities. So how do I multi-infuse uh, our, our business with, we have an Inspedia, for example, which is an online encyclopedia. We mm -hmm. have, uh, that, that's for the people who learn, in a sense, in an academic way and visually. Um, and my main, the sub-question under that was, what virtual team t tools are, um, are employed the most, and what about those tools makes them work? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why are the top three more important than the bottom seven? Mm -hmm. and that's kind of where uh, 
my research took me. And the, the more I get into it, the more I'm, I'm focused more toward the future, what's happening next, the population that you guys deal with. And, uh, and so it's not enough to sit on what we've done. Because technology changes, we have to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If any of you have been in the classroom for a while, you remember the first whiteboard you studied, you took, and where whiteboards are today. Mm -hmm. Same thing is true for any technology process. It's it's not enough to, you know, these are going to get smarter and smarter. So how do you how do you, what tools are available for that? So mm -hmm. in a sense, whenever we do the research, as you know, it's a snapshot of then. Mm -hmm. And if it help, it's helpful. It'll it'll show you what's the human factors that will. Um, still be present in the future. For example, I'm sure you guys have talked about synchronous and asynchronous types of communication. Mm -hmm. Those are and we've used that, for example, even with our Google Hangouts. Right, mm -hmm. right. And, and, you know, so then I had to narrow my definition, for example, through the research. I thought if I was chatting, mm -hmm. that's the same as synchronous. It's really not what, through my research, what I've discovered is that anytime I cannot see your reaction or get a human interaction with you, even if it's real time, mm -hmm. I it's still there's an asynchronous aspect to it. So when I started thinking, when I started, if I can, I can see you, your face, and you and I we're not in the same place, so it's mm -hmm. it's synchronous. But if we're chatting over here, even a smiley face isn't the same as getting the human emotion back. Mm -hmm. So given I have the demographics of my the people who work for us are as young as 18 uh, undergrads who need a part time job all the way through 60. How do I integrate reasonably? Um, what tools would work to do mm. that? Mm -hmm. where, where are we at with that? So, is so far so good? We making yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm taking uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm just taking notes into our um, Moodle chat so that mm -hmm. we both have an archive of what you've been saying, um, as well as so the people who have um, greater challenges joining the um, the Google Hangout, they then watch the Google Hangout later, or they might be watching now. Robin, I'm curious. Uh, if you are able to see it now. So if you can, um, uh, let me know either in the Moodle chat or in the um, group chat for the uh, Hangout. But I think that idea of, uh, you know, we've talked about that as well, you know, what part of it, um, of engaging learners, depends on, for example, seeing their face. Uh, right. And um, so, for example, in the, in the Alverno uh, undergraduate curriculum, we have eight, eight abilities, one of which is social interaction. Right. And recently there was a group of faculty who were gathered together to talk about emerging technologies for social interaction. Well, of course, it really depends what those new emerging technologies are and how they allow you to assess for social interaction. And really it came down to a whole lot of, is it live or is it not? Is it anonymous or is it not? Right. And can you see the person's face or can you not? But there's there's another component I would add too, and that's exclusivity. In other words, if ah, I have a, mm -hmm. I have an app and I'm doing this, mm -hmm. and I'm not, uh, I would I had the good fortune of going to AndevCon, and I saw in San Francisco AndevCon phones now, for example, that can project upward, so that I could leave it on the table, and now two or three people can come around the phone and see the data. Mm. If you and I could talk about the same format, it can project right onto the wall. So I take my phone and it's a projector and you're standing next to me, you and I can look at the research together or look at our project together or our work together. That's different than, all right, look at your phone and you're, all of us are looking at the same data at the same time. That's, that really does cut down on social interaction. I was really impressed by that by saying one phone or one device can just, it's in a sense, it's a, it's a portable whiteboard. Right, right. Well, that's, and I think that's actually something that we noted last semester in my undergraduate course. Um, we did a couple of guest lectures like this with, uh, with via Hangout. In the first one, one of the participants was in her classroom with her students behind her. So just like you are, you know, we can see a little bit of the background behind you, but it was all of her students. They were also live tweeting the Hangout and, um, and occasionally looking at the board, but more than that, they weren't. So just as you gave us a visual of, you know, like looking down, like, like let, let's imagine that I'm just looking down at my device, the, the overall um, effect of it was mm -hmm. one of disengagement. Exactly. And so then subsequent to that, when we had a chance to have a Google Hangout with um, Richard Culotta, who's the Office of Ed Tech um, Director for the U.S. Department of Ed, we really mm -hmm. planned for it. How are we going to put our best 
selves forward? How are we going to show the strengths of Alverno, um, the voices of the students, the diversity, the engagement, um, the student-led uh, aspect of learning there? And so we really had to plan for that, just as you're saying. But I think that also tracing these emerging technologies, as you're describing, in which uh, you might be able to not have one solo device be so individual right. that there might be more collaborative options. That's very interesting to think about. Do you, do you remember, I remember when I started teaching, I had, I was teaching some history courses or church history, and the, the class, um, the, the, the A students would go nuts because they couldn't always take good notes with me mm. because I'm very um, macro, big picture, and they wanted to know the specifics. So it, what I did in the end was saying, okay, the notes will be available after each lecture. I will put them down in bullet points for you, so relax. Mm -hmm. Take down whatever it is. So in other words, they were all doing this, trying to get disengaged, and I wanted to interact with them to see what's going on. Their comfort, so getting back to the, the analogy, is that yes, we can have an experience together, and it's available later, like you're doing for just for what you're doing now. You can mm -hmm. check it and see it. And so that was way back in the day before we had the technology. I just wanted Instead of we used to all take notes, and that was another way of disengaging. And I, I'd rather have had the interaction. Yeah. Well, so then, um, so what did you? Uh, what it, what kinds of data did you gather? Remind us. I, I know because I, I accompanied you through your through your research process. But remind the group um, what kinds of data did you gather? Um, what kinds of and what kind of findings um, resulted from your action research? I I. Listed some tools. I asked them, do they use this this tool for their? For, I focused in on virtual work or or their work. Uh, how would how would they rate the tool if they've used it? How necessary is it? What were the strengths and what were the weaknesses? And then uh, kind of correlated all of that. And in in the end, you will not be surprised what the number one tool was. Nor will you be surprised what the least used tools were, but even that was only two years ago. Those some of those tools have even dropped off the market, and other ones have come back on. The most used tool, by far, in a business setting. Now we're talking. You're talking about kids and learning. Uh, is email. Mm-hmm. Right. Email, because it's cheap. It's asynchronous, which people like. Adults like that. Adults like the fact I I don't have to call you to get this done. I just type it in. It send and I have an archive of it. Yeah, I sent you an email. Mm-hmm. Um, learning environment that won't necessarily, you know, make, make the most sense. Um, the, other, the other tools that we went through are, were video conferencing. Um, this was two years ago before Google Hangouts and other things like that. Skype started taking off before, you know, uh, uh, join.me and things like that got mm -hmm. going. It was more expensive. Mm -hmm. but pay a lot. So that, that, was, that was the downside of that. That was the most popular synchronous tool that, that we came up with. Um, the, the main thing, though, that it, it is, again, um, we're finding is age groups. Mm. The, the synchronous tools are much more appreciated by younger people. They, they want that instant tweet, the instant messaging, the video, the conferencing, hey, let me draw on your board as we do this together, as opposed to older people who are more used to, I just let me plan it, it seems like, and then archive it, and then pull out the resources when I need it. Mm. That was that was more of the, the. I don't know if any of your uh, any of you out there are teaching adults, but that's something to keep in mind is that I can go back and look it over. Kids, of course, what's not they go on to the next thing. And right. Keep, keep well, up. so I'm curious, actually, since Kathy, we have you on and you're able to participate. We didn't talk about how old your students are. What's the age diversity among your students? I have. Um, I think um, one student who just graduated from high school a year ago. Right. Um, and then my oldest student is probably in her early 50s. And then mm -hmm. I have um, in between 30s uh, and 30s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have the, the high end 50s, I have a couple 30s, and then I have a couple maybe early 20s, 19. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so do, do those. Um you know, I'm, I'm mindful that discipline matters, you know, so it may be that in the medical coding field it's different, but are you finding those same kinds of preferences among your students that the younger students might prefer more simultaneously used tools and the older students might prefer more um, gradual meaning making or being able to access things after the fact? Yeah, I, I'm having that issue now. Um, 
I encourage students to go ahead and use their phones and things like that because I know a lot of the younger students, that's what they do. They use their phones all the time. So I don't have any problems with that. But when it comes to the older students who aren't as savvy with their phones or computers, um, I do find it takes them longer to, to get a lot of concepts. Although we're in the electronic field where you have to know computers, they still are really apprehensive about using the computer. Um, yeah. So it's almost like I kind of want to ask them, well, you know, you're kind of in the wrong field if you're scared of the computer. Mm -hmm. But I know that, you know, it, it takes time for them to kind of get used to it, but I, I do think um, a lot of them do get it after a while. But they're, they're more savvy with the book versus the computer. Right. Well, and over in our Moodle chat, uh, Lynn McDonough, who is is able to see us, but is um, but is uh, not able to participate uh, on, or maybe, uh, well, let's see, Lynn, is that? I'm just trying to see it. This I think is Lynn. Yeah. So Lynn, you can you you're sort of you're participating here, but we can't see you. But she's mentioning that younger students that are coming in now to college, she works at Alverno, um, seem to be uncomfortable with one-on-one -on -one social interactions. So that might be interesting if their wheelhouse is texting. Um, how comfortable might they then be or not with, uh, for example, um, hangouts? You know, like is is this comfortable for them or is it uncomfortable because of its relational quality? What's your take on that, Matt? Well, I think it, it has to do with how they're raised, uh, mm -hmm. their, their experience of social interaction when everything is at a distance and it's real time. How many times have we seen kids text people in the same room that they're with? Just as a note because they don't want person X to hear what they're saying about person Y. And and so that I'm getting my, my thought out but I'm not necessarily socially interacting. It reminds me on the survey, I did not ask specific age, I asked a range. And there were, there were two different things that I noticed. The younger they were, to your point, the social interaction wasn't that big a deal. The older they were, the social action was important, but also their, their concerns about security, by that means their personal security, was much higher in older people than it was about in younger people. It seems like it's not an issue. It's almost they, they've checked, hey, I know, I know everything I say on Facebook can be seen. I know all this on Twitter. I know all that, and that's not a deterrent. It's to getting getting back to um, Catherine's point that um, older people, this could be another hesitancy to using the technology. If I type this, do you really think five years from now you can find it again? The answer is yes, of course. And right. but because we're older, we we'll, we'll stop and think. Uh, it's not an issue with younger people. They, you know, I've I've asked many of them. You realize this can be used against you, perhaps in a job or yeah, I know everything. There's and there's no there's no secrets anymore. It's kind of how it works. Interesting. Well, yeah, and you and I were talking about that somewhat earlier. Is is yeah. what difference do you see? I mean, I I really see you. The reason that I asked you to come is is in addition to your work being very interesting. I think you seem by disposition to be somebody who seeks out. Um, information about emerging technologies so that you can remain abreast of these changes and think about connections to your workplace. So in that sort of role as a thought leader, what's your take on how um, those of us who serve younger um, populations of students um, are considering the role of privacy, the role of um, the permanent record in teaching and learning? What's your take? There, we are, we are the adults, they're the kids. We have to safeguard anyone under the age of 18, and, and I really believe in that. That doesn't change their individual practices, though. So as a, as a generation, they are more like, yeah, there is no such thing as privacy. We know that. That still inc not, doesn't eliminate any uh, disencumbrance us to take care of them. The things that I look at, especially now, um, is with technology specifically, you cannot be where you are. Where you are will not get you where you want to go. You must look ahead to what's coming because that is the next generation. And generations, as far as technology is concerned, is getting closer and closer. We're not talking the um, age generation. We're talking technical generation. The turnover time on these things is roughly four to five years. So tools that we're talking about right now will be extinct. And new tools we haven't thought of will be here. And as far as that's concerned, where we're at right now is wearable technology. Mm -hmm. We have to, this wearable technology, for example, will, can make um, older people uh, feel more comfortable if they're comfortable with the device to begin with because it's, in a sense, it's all done for you. What you see, what your eyes see, what it's, 
kind of I don't have to push any buttons now. F5 does what? None of that. It just kind of takes care of that. And the younger people, of course, leverage that for all sorts of reasons. Um, I was just read heard today where Google Glass is being used uh, by the Republican parties, specific, uh, specifically, to go to conventions, get data, and mine the big data. And now we're going to use these devices to teach our people what it is we want to know. Um, so I see wearable devices being really important. Right now we have the smartwatches, we have Google Glass, um, but that's almost a phase to what I really understand to be the future. It's already here, but getting back to your point about privacy is embedded technology. We, uh, I truly believe, I'm not one um, prone to hyperbole, I truly believe it's within seven years at least uh, children will have chips in them. And now, I don't want people to panic. It's already being done. You can get digital tattoos um, that read your 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 medical data, uh, especially if it's special conditions. You can get mm -hmm. uh, chips that. Um, and when I go to these big data conferences, we sit around and we talk about this. And the advantages that people see, like for example, your chip will have your passport in it. Everything's mm -hmm. right there. Your academics will be right there. The Khan Academy, more germane than what we're talking about here, really sees the idea of all the things that you've learned are in this chip. And the role of the teacher then is to see the data and go, this person needs re a remediation in phonics, or this person mm -hmm. needs remediation in what, wherever they're at. Take that person out, teach them, and get them back in the group where they're being taught by technology. Mm -hmm. And the teacher is, is the remediator through the big data. And that yeah. just stays with you. Right, and, I, and as we were um, practicing earlier today to make sure our Hangout technology would work, and, we, and you mentioned that, of course, you know, I have two small children, and that idea of where things are going, and, and you know, even as, like, the nerdiest technology, you know, file that I am, that, that hits me somehow kind of deeply and um, is, is, I think, disconcerting about um, even what this implies for what it means to be human, or what it means to be autonomous in your humanity, you know, exactly. like, because of course, like to the security thing, maybe this is a, a an indicator of the fact that I'm moving over to the older the older folks band of things. But you know that that idea of, um, well, what does it mean if you can hack a person? Mm-hmm. But you know, the drivers on this is all. Or, believe it or not, I believe the driver in all this is children. For example, my wife is a K four teacher. Mm -hmm. He's aware of who is comes from a disadvantaged background, and one of her centers, learning centers, is the iPad. Mm. Well, all the kids who know how to use the iPad would fly over there. She doesn't let them do that. The kids who don't have it at home, she wants to go over there and gives them turns so that they can be socially. That's her social interactions real big for her. They want she wants them to, to get up to speed. Mm -hmm. There's no parent that would say, I, "If I could give this to my child, I would." So you're trying to tell me there's a device out there that I can track them. Mm -hmm. I can. Uh, if they get in a medical emergency, we can download the fact that they're di juvenile diabetic, mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of things, family history. Oh, I want that for my child. That will drive the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, you no, know, it's a first world issue in a sense, uh, and it's usually what the, how parents view, you know, what they what they can give the best thing they can give for their children. That will drive the technology. I heard, also heard today that Google is just buying up, for example, tons of robotic companies. And there's there is a there's a correlation between that and you know robotics and chips the privacy issues that's great how do you protect that again let's go back to the younger generation what privacy we don't have privacy we don't care we know that right so that's where I believe jumping to the chip can be it'll be us going wait a minute you know the metaphysics of it all in a sense right. and, and the philosophy of it all and then we would we we would worry about it. I don't know if you have you ever been to Japan for example. Mm -hmm. The smartphone, if you put your, you can put your thumbprint on it to prove it's you, and then th there's no such thing as a credit card. You just swipe, you just swipe, and you pay with your phone. Comes right off. That. They've now developed the chip in your thumb. You pay with your thumb. Yeah. It knows who you are. Right. So now let's think about that as learners. The chips, if we know all the accumulated data, how much time do teachers spend assessing? Mm-hmm. In a sense, if all the data is right there, download, there's an algorithm that says this child needs this, 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 and this, the teachers will go, oh, that'll save me a ton of time. The yeah. test is almost, in a sense, done. 
And that's what the Khan Academy is pushing for. So without blowing, you know, the, the, the main purpose of this, what I really want you to what focus, what I learned from my research is it's not enough to take a snapshot. You have to look ahead. And then, of course, the under driving factor is cost. I mean, mm -hmm. as data comes down, as the cost of these chips come down, as big companies like Google get involved in these bigger projects, cost becomes manageable. Yeah. Well, so, and, and it's interesting that we're actually, you, you can see down below that Micah Hernandez has joined us. He is a, a high school teacher in West Dallas. Um, and so, Micah, as you probably gathered, we were talking about um, how, how Matt is, um, orients himself to looking ahead and that part of what he's seeing is that idea of wearable technology or potentially and a little bit of, um, you know, futuristic, it makes me think of the Matrix, right? Like I know right, Kung yeah. Fu. Um, but that idea of what could be the non-apocalyptic, non-terrible, non-zombie um, bonus <laughs> to wearable technology or at some point, you know, integrated into someone's body for the, what are the implications then for a K-12 practitioner? What's your take on that? I, I um, am just catching up on the chat. I'll tell you one thing um, I, I'm interested in, Matt, and I'll, I'll check out on what I missed, but uh -huh. it was so funny. Today we were doing something and, and um, the kids needed their Apple IDs and, and someone, you know, so we'll go figure it to and this one girl just, you know, said, that's why we need our thumbprints. You need to just put your thumb on the screen and boom, that's you. No more Apple IDs. And from what I gathered, I, you, you're talking about a chip here and then i got to catch up on the chat, but that's exactly where we're headed. And that'll be so convenient if you can just imagine that, the, the ease with which that would have helped me today had we been able to just put our thumb on the touch screen and there we go. Mm -hmm. Well, and, I, you know, it makes me think about, like, actually the nexus of your work and Kathy's work because of course if you then have um, and to Matt's point about for example if you are a diabetic you know this idea of needing to depend on a medic you know medic alert bracelet my my brother's actually a type 1 diabetic and when he went to college it was tremendously alarming for my parents because it was going to be the first time that he was very very far away from them and uh, and like many type 1 diabetics, you know, sometimes it just, you have an insulin reaction and you can't express yourself very well. And you're really at the mercy of um, the kindness of the strangers around you and how, you know, I mean, everybody deals with scariness when their children go to college, but if they have any kind of disability that would impair their ability to get help for themselves, that really plays into it. So, I mean, I think that it's interesting to think about how do we design uh, and prepare ourselves pedagogically for an era in which things could really be changing. You know, what would it imply for Kathy's work if the people for whom she's preparing medical coding have a digital tattoo or a, um, a chip that has all of their healthcare information? Or how does it change things for Micah's practice if, you know, the student just can put their thumb on their, on their you know, one-to-one -one device and have all of their data come up and then the same is true when they're at home. Right. In the medical industry, particularly, it's being driven to that due to the nationalization through the Affordable Care Act that the systems have to be able to communicate with all of them with the goal that any device can read any device. That, that setup is, is supposed to be happening. And I think there's even a deadline, October of this year, that has to be uh, to the same standard. So one of the goals of that is precisely like you said, these digital tattoos, uh, cardiac uh, implants, um, no need for a band, or that's all supposed to be ready yet this year. So it's that close. Even Stephen Hawking, the great Stephen Hawking, he, he talks based on a chip above his eye. Mm. And, it's, and so there, you can see with the uses of it, it, it we, we all get a little nervous about you know, what can you read, or who can read it, or who can hack a person if there's such a thing like that. But uh, there's so much money behind it right now that I really think it's inevitable. And there's even, like I said, the Khan Academy model and other models is, is affecting learning sees the teacher then as the chief, or mediator in chief is really what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and so every kid can learn at their own pace, and you have the data then to mediate each child in any, any specific line or any specific area. So. It's it's interesting to me that you have you know your wife then has K four learners in her setting. Um, what does she take away from your expertise, and how does it help her think about um, 
you know, the, the preparing those small children for a world that might really rest on some of these emerging trends. There's research that talks about what age is appropriate to give kids technology, how much technology, and I'll tell you honestly, and I'll be glad to rebroadcast this back when we have her see it. She came home so excited. She has these centers, and you know what toys now are the most popular? Not the iPads, not red solo cups. <laughs> maybe blue, maybe small. She said they stack them. They 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 grow. You know, this is a column. They get them as high as they can. And then she's got kids with diff different issues in her class, and certain kids can only knock them down, and so they build them for the kids so they can knock them down. And she's just standing back and going. As a four, someone who teaches four-year-old, they have to learn to get along, to interact, to follow the rules. It's not technology-based. <laughs> for her point of view, it's not technology-based. Uh, so th th there's a little story there. I think you have to be very careful when you introduce it. And I like that idea of giving those kids who aren't exposed to these at home access to it so they can at least have the same vocabulary. They can be talking apples to apples with their peers or whatever. Um, there's comes a time and a place to interview that. I really think you can do technological overkill mm -hmm. uh, at, at, at certain developmental age, and I'm re the research is not complete on that. But there's there's a lot of research that says that don't be giving this to kids before two. Yeah. <laughs> After two, you know, tablet games, colors, and things like that. But in far as the classroom, you know, cl K four classrooms turn around very quickly, and you don't. Have, you don't you have to learn to get along, and that the technology is probably not the best way to do that. That's her right. take. Right. Well, and, and that idea of, you know, what the main instructional outcome of a K-4 classroom is, how are we going to be together as human beings in a group right. that, that isn't our family group? You know, right. that, having been a teacher of young children myself, that was the, that's the main thing, and it's not an insignificant thing for children to learn, particularly if they've been in a diverse array of preschool kinds of settings. Some of them might have been in, you know, in at, at home with a primary caregiver. Some of them might have been in small uh, daycare centers. Some of them might have been in very large uh, daycare um, settings in which they're very used to being able to take directions, for example, from people who aren't their parents or follow mm -hmm. rules or sit down for a sustained period of time or whatever. Right. But I, I like that image of the red, the red solo cups because some of it is just even the kinesthetic. We don't want to neglect, and that I think is an interesting loop back to some of the wearables idea because right now at least in order to, in, or at least let's say in the last five years, before the advent of all these mobile devices, and I want to say that, that Micah teaches in West Dallas where the district has heavily invested right. in mobile devices. And so you know, like when his kids are working on devices, it doesn't presume, for example, that they be seated in a lab and completely sedentary. They might, for example, right, Micah, be taking them around the school or documenting things in different ways. Absolutely, right. Yep. Yeah. So then the that, yeah, that but that idea of like where is the kinesthetic in it right. Um, right. comes out yeah. in a new way. Can, they, can, they, can the kids in the high school take their data and project it out to the group pretty easily? Well, this is what right. I'm working on. This is what I want to show people. They can do that? Yeah, it's been pretty neat. Um, we're and, and again, it's there's a lot of learning. There's a large learning curve for teachers as well. But um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's an understatement. Yeah. But, uh, just yeah, we project it out. We do share folders. We um, we have Apple like, Apple TVs, and so it's working out pretty neat. When something comes together, it's really neat. There's just you have to plan for that learning curve. There's certainly a, um, you know you have to take a step backwards and be patient as students learn this. But they're when they get it, they're they're really producing quality stuff that they're proud of too. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm curious to hear um, the various folks, so Kathy and, and Matt and Micah maybe, um, consider how, um, what exactly can we teach novices? So imagine, for example, that you have a, a new colleague, any one of you. Um, what are the things, up, like considering that, as Matt said, these technologies are changing so rapidly, what are the underpinnings? Um, that that might that we might develop in people um, that that help them get over what Kathy was describing as real apprehension, for example, on the part of some of her learners. But I would imagine that for some of her newer colleagues, if they haven't experienced this as well, it might be a struggle for them. What are those those things underneath the learning curve that you could potentially teach or recruit for? I I have I'm in that position. I uh, we my uh, co uh, 
partner is retiring. And we brought on another partner who's a little bit older than me. And today I taught him Google Drive, and I've been teaching him some other things like that. And one of the things that we have to be careful of is speed. Mm -hmm. We cannot assume that people, you know, especially older people, cannot, that what we know they know. Uh, and the, the best thing to turn me into a computer programmer, I mean, I go back to 1977, I was starting to write code way back then, is it's okay to fail. Technology has these great things like recovery. Oh, hey, I can't find my spreadsheet. That's okay. It's Google Docs. It's saved every keystroke. You're kidding me. Yeah. Oh, there it is. And everything I worked on is still there. Don't panic. So kind of get the ratchet on the level saying it's okay to make a mistake. And control mm -hmm. that's your best friend. Save. <laughs> you know, kind of save as you go along. Uh, and don't assume that your tempo is their tempo. Um, as I was saying, you, know, the kid, you guys are younger than me, that the old digital natives. I happen to be old enough to and, and been working in technology so long that I kind of like feel like that I can see the digital progress. And so don't assume that our progress will um, just can be matched by the other person. Last, last thing on that point is the first day I started teaching, I was teaching something, and I came back, and a, a lady who I later learned to love and respect, and she looked at me and said, you look a little down. I said, well, I, I don't know if I fired him up. And she just looked at me and she said, Matt, just remember, these people may not be as passionate about it as you are. Mm -hmm. Your job is to learn how to be passionate. You can't do that on the first day. And I feel that that same way is true with the technology. And they see the success we have. It just You have to be very patient. And you know they're going to stop when they realize, that's enough. I don't want to learn anymore. Mm -hmm. but that's kind of my take. Right. Just, you be slow and know some that. So, Kathy and Micah, what are your takes? I mean, so that I would imagine that that probably is, you know, Learning early that it's okay to fail is probably mm -hmm. is probably something in, that I've heard both of you address. But what what's your take, like um, Kathy? If you were going to have a new person take over your course or be hired into your department, what would be some of the qualities you'd be looking for that would help them as learners? Um, I'd like someone to be um, enthusiastic about what they're doing, what they're teaching students. Um, I had to learn patience myself, so I would like for someone to have uh, patience as well because they're, um, given our population of students, we, um, we just have a wide range of abilities and skills. And so it takes a lot of patience, um, you know, and, and be willing to, to work with a student and, and um, use the technology because we have access to so much at our school. Um, but I do find that a lot of teachers, even when they first start, don't even approach using the technology. So, um, and, and that's not good because we're moving towards technology. So right. They think they can avoid it, but they can't. Right. A lot of them still say, well, all I have is my flip phone, and that's all I need. You know? <laughs> flip phone, yes. Luddites, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... So I, th I mean, I think that's that's an interesting um, dilemma to help you know to be invitational about these inevitable changes in ways that make people want to move toward it as opposed to shut down. Yeah. And um, Lynn is also saying over here in the chat that there are so many ways to approach technology and troubleshoot an issue that there's no right or wrong way of doing something. So you have to be comfortable with what you know. And I think that that's that's a good point too, like that. You described it, Kathy, as staying calm, but that idea of patience and or, or p being patient and that idea of calm and patience, I think, has has so much to do with how we're going to continue to move forward and keep our eye ahead, is by sort of also staying centered in where you are at that at that moment. Michael, what's your take? If you guys are hiring for new faculty, what are the things they they need to maybe already know or at least be willing to learn? Um. <clears throat> What was said was really good. I think one little thing I'd add, and I, I always try to speak a little too quickly here. I feel like not everybody's K-12, but as far as in my realm, um, so professionals coming into it right now need to be really understanding that the whole structure is changing. It really is. That, and by that, I think I mean I think I mean whole group instruction, gradual release model. You almost have to be. And, and um, you said someone just just mentioned in the chat the. Uh, having a patient, you almost have to be okay with, with not, I don't want to say chaos, except that I, I do go down to middle school, and there it does look like chaos sometimes. <laughs> you, uh, 
in, in high school, in high school, it's cool because in high school, it's getting a little bit more, especially with my upper levels, it's getting a little bit more like I'd expect a really um, inquiry-based and um, high intrinsically motivated learners, that kind of environment. It's starting to look like that where I can walk in and, and, and the volume's at a good level and students are using that technology in such great ways. Oftentimes, you know, I'm ready to pull my hair out at the middle school level, but when you look around, they're, they're just as engaged and they're doing their job. They just they operate on such a higher level of volume often and enthusiasm. <laughs> but um, you really need teachers that are not going to stand there in front of the classroom for more minutes than our generation's, this day's youth allows their attention span to, to, to tolerate. And so I think that's really important and it's so hard because we need to get out of our comfort zone. It's really not, we think back, what was high school like? Let's do it that way because it, it works for me, I learned. And you can't do that anymore. And we shouldn't with this kind of technology and the tools we have. Um, again, I'm, re I'm getting on to what other people have already said, but use it daily and use it in such a manner that students can dive into inquiry with it. And, you know, I, I've learned so much from the kids, too. I mean, I, I as the instructor, don't learn everything. Um, here's an example. Uh, just recently, we did found some really cool activities that we were doing online to practice some of the skills we were doing. And... I couldn't get past the fact that my district did not choose the Chromebook or the MacBook route. They chose to give everybody iPads. And uh, Apple doesn't vibe well with Flash. And so I couldn't get past that. You needed this for the, that activity. And it was a sixth grader, or no, a seventh grader. He just said, well, use Puffin. And there I go. I figured out that Puffin, guys, is this browser that it, it's a browser. It's Explorer, or Firefox, Chrome, whatever. It's another browser that nobody knows about. But it has found a way on the iPad. It functions without Flash, and everything works just fine. And so they, they taught me that. And have I not? Do I not let them speak up? Do I take control of the class and do the teacher thing? And they're the just the people listening. I would never have learned that. So yeah. it, it's cool. Mm -hmm. did, you say, did you say Dolphin was a browser? Dolphin like oh, the thing. Uh, puffin. Puffin like a pu puffin bird. Yeah. Puffin. Yeah. Dolphin's yeah. On, on. Yeah, I was wondering because Dolphin's on. Uh, Android, not Mac. Okay, good. Oh, so okay. is it a yeah. similar thing for Android Dolphin? Yes, and it uh, also allows you to go get a desktop view on your phone, which is probably kind of cool. Oh, yeah. That's all the stuff that I, a geek like me would know. Um, yeah. I wanted to follow up with you guys and ask you guys a question. I find it's easy, it, when I taught that age in particular, or maybe even adults, with the access to all this knowledge, that's what technology is, it's access to others who have gone before their knowledge, how do you assimilate that into understanding? There's mm. a big difference, you know. Uh, I know knowledgeable people, but that doesn't mean a great deal to me that they understand it. And that's our frustration maybe as teachers. We've, we've already gone through that process. And therefore, the answer, you know, I see a lot of people who are stenographers, as they, they used to be in the past, just write things down. How, how do you think technology can move people to understanding? I'm in a business. I need. I can see A, B, C there. If you don't produce, you're with kids, and that's that's a circle. Mm. So how, how do you how, how do you use technology? How do you know they understand after they've seen all this knowledge? How do you do that? That's a great question. I mean, as I think in my case, um, one of the things is is having that I benefit from is being in an institutional level in a place that does formative assessment. So um, it, so I, for example, can use some tools even as an icebreaker to get a bead on how people are feeling in the class. So, you know, um, like I use a lot of, I don't have clickers, you know, we haven't invested in clickers, for example, at Alverno because we have smaller class sizes, but now we don't need them because everybody's phone can be a clicker, and as long as it texts, it can be, uh, you can use poll everywhere and things like that that would allow people to chime in with their responses. But I think it really depends on how, in your local setting, you define understanding, right? Because right. I, could ha I could give people a multiple choice. If I had a 200-person freshman English lecture, Right. I could have a multiple choice test and uh, or you know quiz response and they can click in, but mm -hmm. that I I don't tend to use things like that as much. I might, for example, um, ask my students to text in an anonymous poll everywhere saying today I feel blank because, and okay. so that I can get almost like a community circle type effect, and then I would just have it represented as a word cloud. So the day that I did it was those that day probably two or three weeks ago when it was abnormally lovely, like it was maybe the first day after these polar vortices where it had gotten above 30. 
Right. And I think it maybe even got to like 38, so it was a real heat wave. Um, but the, uh, the, the first word, the biggest word in the word cloud was happy. And <laughs> all, everywhere around it was, um, you know, the less frequently mentioned words, for example, um, optimistic, summer, springtime, bird song. Uh, outside, you know, these kinds of things like this is the, you know, they, they were saying I feel happy because today is the first day that I've been able to go outside without, you know, my big parka or whatever it is. But that then helps me get a bead on the emotional tenor of the classroom, which I think is an important part of, of how we get to understanding. I mean, I think it gets to that affective part. I think for me the emotions in the classroom really make a difference especially with my undergraduate population where they are learning to be leaders in ways that are different from my graduate students. My graduate students by and large are coming from positions of leadership um, or are at least consciously developing that capacity in themselves by selecting into a master's degree program. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's something where there's something about the transformative process of being an undergraduate student that I try to think about how I can develop what are other people's thoughts? Like, how do you use um, Matt's question about how you access other people's knowledge and how you help them assimilate that into understanding? And for those of you who can hear us but are in the Moodle chat, you could type in those questions as well. I, I want to chime in because this is exactly mm -hmm. kind of what I've talked with you as being my big focus this spring, Desiree. Mm -hmm. And I, I've technology has been such a tool for communication and and I've, I've been able to put everything out there. And there's really no longer any excuse for missing something that we do in class. You don't even have to be present to get something out of it. And th that's cool, but that's one way. And so I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, I think your question, it, it really has to do with how do they use the tool, what a great tool it is, to, sh to show, show me that understanding, to show me that they're, they're growing. And I, I never before have been able to just say, here's our unit objectives again. Here, here were our learning targets. Remember the last three weeks? This is what we've been over You've proved you can do it, but now now really show me. Put it together and show me evidence. Showcase your skills to me. And, and I've, the pressure has always been on the teacher to think creatively and, and come up with some cool project and get the kids interested. And then no matter what you, no matter how proud I am of my idea, how great I think it is, that way is always going to let down a student or two. It's always not going to be their style. It's not their intelligence. You know, it, it's not their strength. And never before have I been able to say, here at least so effectively, here is our goal, here are our targets, these are the objectives, please show me and know them, show, showcase it. And for something like that, the last time I did it was uh, about a week and a half, you know, two weeks ago, and um, I had everything from, the technology just enables them to so creatively say, here's what I know, Mr. Mendes, here's what we got, and, and they, everything. I had, it, it was very similar, Desiree, to your first class on campus where mm -hmm. we had people doing garage band. And two kids did that. They wrote a song. It was cool. And and we had people doing puppet pals and people doing and this and that. And I'll never name them all. And that's how I'm learning, too, because I've never seen this app before. That's really neat. How did you do that? Mm -hmm. And it, it's really, I love, it's neat that I can communicate everything. But again, that's one way. And it's really neat when it comes their turn. Now it's, it's and again, it's, it's assessment time. They don't always like that. But um, of, of, of course, along the way, we do, Alverno especially got me thinking lots of the little formative assessments, those little checkups along the way. And when it comes time for the big one, it's cool. It's really neat what they can creatively. It's, it's no longer just show me what you understand. Technology is giving them the tools to creatively exhibit that. And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's so made my job more interesting. Sorry, go ahead. I'm hearing you both say that the tools is an assimilation thing, where it's a means to an end and for the right temperament, they can use it to express, and this is what I know um, or understand. I was kind of looking at the, the, you know, the copy and paste. I can, I can grab knowledge, but it doesn't mean they get it. You've got activities going on, like, okay, now that you've got all the knowledge, show me by creating a puppets or show me by writing a play or show me by singing and stuff. So it's, you've gotten, in a sense, what you're doing is you're done with the technology, or now you have to perform. You see what I mean? Yes. Right. So so the technology gets you to a point where you have to perform. So now that's where I think business and education do touch in that, you know, I'm, I'm certifiable ADD. And why do ADD kids not like school? Because it's performance-based. And if you've got variable performance over time, you're going to have an issue. 
uh, and I seemed to do really well in school with teachers that would say, he can't do it the way the rest of the kids do it, and, but you know, if I leave him alone, it's going to come up. I wouldn't have done it that way, but here's the answer. You're mm -hmm. saying these kids can do it whatever way they want to do it as long as they assimilate it and in the end produce it somehow. So back mm -hmm. to the word performance. Is that, um, does that, does that, is that a good assimilation or a summary of what I'm hearing? Does that make sense? I don't want to cut out Shelley and Lynn too. I, I can't see what they're saying. But. Yeah. So I uh, so far we have not had a chiming in from from them so far. But I can also, uh, if there are reflections that people have after today, I can then take them back to you, uh, Matt, and see if if there are other things, other questions that arise from people having watched this later. Well, and and then the Catherine's situation too is that the technology in the end has to be used to produce something. Right. right? And how does that? It's not enough to just have the tools. It's still incumbent on you to learn how to produce something. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, when I when I wrote my paper, um, one of the things I did with the flipping part of uh, of a unit in a class was that I used different types of technology for um, the student for the lecture. So I had a regular PowerPoint with notes. I had a, a MP3 version, audio version with a transcript. Um, I had a narrated PowerPoint, and I would have them do short self-assessments, um, and then I would have them do things like a crossword puzzle, and the end result is a discussion. So they have to you know, think about what they did and what they read, and then discuss it, and then when they get back to the classroom, that's when we're going to apply it, and that's when I'm going to be able to tell whether or not they understood what they read. And oh. did so. That's my way of trying to measure. Yeah. Very good. And so, so you, I think that that gets back to that idea you were talking about, Matt, of the teacher as um, remediation specialist. You know, so that, that Kathy now is able to address misconceptions, for example, because the content delivery part, just as in the the best flipped classrooms, is for you know, basically foregrounded before the uh, engagement in class. Right. Very true, and so the more, I, but then they, you go back to the other side, and it's the politics of it, and it's the technology of it, is the data collection, it's the big data. How much we know can help us determine where to go, and how much is the right threshold, what's usable, and how much time do we want to invest in collecting that data. So that's where it comes back full circle, you know, that's where technology can come in handy to collect the data. Yeah. Uh, but I, that's what I'm using, I'm using the Blackboard learning system, and okay. in that I can track the statistics, so I can track the number of times they looked at the lecture, the number of times they may have used the audio, you know, so I can tell which one, which method is um, working the most, and um, I can also track uh, track how many times they may take an assessment or something like that. So mm -hmm. I'm gathering the statistics while they're working on this. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. I think that idea of being able to, um, you know, use mind the learning management system for data about the learning innovations. So, for right. example, just so like you mentioned, um, uh, the to a certain extent, the the Moodle the the shift to Moodle has meant that no longer, and this is not necessarily the case with the grad students again, because of overall kind of intentionality about being in college. Uh, but at times, at in the undergraduate level, sometimes people will say like, oh, well, I didn't see that, or oh, I turned that in, you didn't see it. But of course, with Moodle, you can see, just as with Blackboard, any learning management system now can make evident how many, when is the last time the person accessed the learning management system? What did they look at? Um, how many times did they look at it? So for example, if, uh -huh. if, if I have a major assignment, and I have an undergrad student who says, um, well, I just don't understand it. Can you explain it to me a different way? And I know that they actually looked at it only once five weeks ago. You know, it, it might tell me, not to, not to disparage them, but to, to help them see that those resources are there for them and that they should um, be accessing them to support their own learning because I think that that's the point of any of our teaching is that we want to give that agency to the people who we serve as learners. And we want them to come away with the capacity not only to just remember the content that they got, but to have these strategies for continuously learning as they go forward. Do you, uh, this is, 
bell went off in my head. On my website, I have a privacy policy because when you come in, I, I have to tell you that I'm collecting data X, Y, Z about you. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do not sell to third parties, uh, blah, blah, blah. Do your students know that they, what you know? That's a good question. I don't know. I, I, when you're dealing with adults, you've got to be a little careful here. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that uh, I am very transparent about the way that I use Moodle, in part because I want my students in that technology class to be able to come out of it knowing Moodle. And we've actually had uh, Shelley and Anna um, took a look. Uh, I let them into my sandbox Moodle, which basically I can make anybody a teacher of. Um, so that they could see from the driver's perspective what it looks like. Um, well, and so just so with my undergrad class, I do let them know, like, look, you know, this is a way that this is how I built this. This is how we can see how many times, for example, somebody um, posted in a chat. You know, like if we were to go, we've got um, Shelly, for example, and Micah and Lynn and Robin are over here in the in the chat window as well. Um, and so when, when this chat is automatically archived, we can then go, of course, we're participating orally, so this isn't a meaningful thing. But if we were only participating via chat, then they and I can see, for example, let's say that um, Matt was posting twice as often as Micah. That might be good information for both people to have um, because it might mean that Matt needs to, to dial it down a little bit or that Micah needs to step it up. Um, but I think, I think that's, that's an interesting point about any higher ed setting because it's also not like they can opt out of it either. Right, but I found the performance of my inspectors went up and stay up the day I told them, this is what I know about you when you come online, how I know it, and oh, so he knows I was here, or I spent this much time doing this. Yes, I know that. I'm just letting you know that. So then that eliminates the excuses. Yeah, that's interesting. You know what I mean? It yeah. does eliminate the excuses. Like you said about, well, you know, I just don't understand it. Well, you know that I can see that you, I've told you before the class started, I can see how often you log on, and right. here's the date, two, twice in five months. So. Right. So I, I like to tell that up front as a learning tool. So they know how you know. It's not magic. It's it's technology. So then when they learn that from you, when they go to Amazon.com to buy something, they'll have learned, this is a lot like Moodle, and Amazon knows everything I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it. That technology literacy grows. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I yeah, really that's like, a good point. I like sharing that with you know the, with the appropriate age group. It's like, yeah. this is how what I know. Yeah, that's interesting. Is there All right. That, so, that, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Micah. No, on a lighter note, but that kind of ruins Christmas surprises because I can go on Amazon and see <laughs> everything my wife has bought me. It pops up there in the ads, correct? That, yes. It's well, and that always watch out yeah. for this famous, you know, like, you know, yeah, and like some cases where people <laughs> might find out. Uh, Micah, everybody, so that you know, had his uh, third child a few weeks ago, and so you know, I would imagine that your Amazon is. Uh, yeah. is populated with diapers and things like that. So and you could learn all about me just by going out. Sure. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so Matt, given what our what terrain our our conversation has covered, what are some charges or some interesting things to think about that you would like to give to this group? I I think a combination of everything. What Micah says, the kids can teach you. A lot of ways you have. I have a. I have a mindset with my. This is how I use it, and because I'm not afraid of it, technology. I like it when other people show it to me. Hey, did you know it could do this, this, and this too? Mm -hmm. uh, that's how kind of grew the business okay. and my business is. But it also in the presentation was pretty critical. Okay. When you when we know something, and we want to share it with somebody, it can be intimidating. And so it's mm -hmm. the learning curve. Uh, um, it can be. Uh, you know, uh, power. If there's a power in technology. If you can master technology, you can create a barrier. Uh, and you know, from for whatever reason, um, it's kind of a temperament. It's the wizard temperament. And if you're a wizard and you, and I'm not, or they feel like that, you have to get it down to the level of this is a tool. All of this, we're really talking about a tool. And getting back to our point, is that I'm really glad to hear all of you are saying. In the end, you have to perform. Alverno is all about performance. Okay, that's great, but in the end, produce something. Mm -hmm. So we have to stress that with our tools. So, so to your point about the chip and how that made the matrix things, 
and uh, whatever's coming in the future, I look at the technology is, am I aware that I'm being marketed to? And if I'm aware of it, that's huge understanding. That, does, that doesn't mean I can stop it, but at least I'm aware of it. And the same thing is true about everything going forward. Am I aware of how others, the developers of the technology, are trying to manipulate me? That's part of the American lifestyle. Mm -hmm. so going forward, I guess, looking, that's not going to change. There's, you know, that's what marketing is in businesses. But in, how does it help me perform? And if it doesn't, jettison it. It's, mm -hmm. I don't need it. It doesn't, it, it is pure marketing or it is pure business or it's not related to what I need. Um, I have to remember that even you know, I write code for a living, I, I communicate tech, I speak into all these things. It's the tool. It, it's just a tool. Yeah. And so you need some space. And so to your point about getting like, what's your mood today? What's your feeling today? I think that's great because that's a different side of the brain, just as, just as critical. Uh, Mike's idea of just using all these tools but in the end to produce something and something from your temperament, from your personality, that's that's great. So yeah. I, I, when I talk about collaboration, use all the tools, know what the weaknesses are. You know, asynchronous, you can't, you can't tell feelings, you can't tell thoughts. Uh, a lot of times it can be used as warehousing, um, warehousing data, and then that also can be mined. Uh, also be aware that these digital watches that we've seen, have you seen those lately? Mm -hmm. They're also taking your pulse, so there's a biometric thing. Pulse, pulse, feelings, kids can learn, oh my god, my heart rate is racing, I better not talk now. They're actually using that. Kids yeah. the, the number is 140. That means you're too excited, don't talk. You an ADHD kid? Okay. Yeah. Get down, okay. 80. Okay, mom, I want to say something. You Interesting, see? right, like the, like the um, re regulating your biometrics in a certain uh, amount, uh, extent and linking it to your learning. And it, like self-assessing. Thinking about self-assessment, what's possible when you have a Fitbit, you know, yeah. that, that you know, like, wow, I'm really grouchy. Maybe it's because I've moved 600 steps today as opposed to 6,000. Exactly. And yeah. That, that's the way. That's the way the future and this, the holistic. If so, in conclusion, sense that if it, if this makes a, uh, technology advances me holistically, if it, if it makes me uh, a better member of society, it's great. Uh, even if it's something so stupid that gives me fun, you know, that's fine. But be aware, we have to help our people understand when they're being marketed to and when they are, there's privacy issues. And th those are not going away. That's right. This is only going only gonna to yeah. grow. Well, I just want to thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful conversation. Um, for everybody who's been uh, watching, I know that I speak for all of us in, in appreciating your time and your service as an alum of our program. Um, though some of you who, who decide to focus on technology for your final action research projects may see Matt again because he is in my regular rotation of, uh, of people to ask if they can come and assess um, at, at, at that 753 event. But, um, I've got, a, I've got a sort of set of, of who are my tech folks. So if there's a tech focus, I try to match them up with one of those folks. Um, but really, I just, I just thank you so much. My and a uh, uh, round of applause for Matt. <laughs> I, I have been where you are. And the first thing I say when I walk up to do the final assessment is congratulations on your final assessment. Yes. It's <laughs> where you're at. So yes. no. Thank you. And I also want to give you guys uh, kudos for your academic discipline. Today is St. Patrick's Day, and here's it. <laughs> so, it's true. Excited. It's true. I'm not even wearing green, but the nice thing about us being distance is that no one can pinch me. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so I'm, I'm going to stop the broadcast, but thanks again. Everybody else, if you can, bop over to the Moodle chat, um, and we'll just make sure that we close up a couple things over there.